two vital things that most used car buyers just overlook. Plus, two big swinging nuts at the end. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Coming up today, the nutbag fringe takes me on for my <coughs> foul mouth. <coughs> Off camera too, he's such a cock about it. <coughs> but first, a question I got yesterday from a chap named Ben Williams, which opens the door to a potentially big problem out there on our roads. Don't let this happen to you. I'll try not to swear. Re Hyundai i30 ESP sensor. Unfortunately, my 2010 i30 has only just now started having an issue with the ESP sensor. The ESP indicator light on the dash started staying on and the ESP button is completely unresponsive. Then today, off to work, first thing I had no power steering for a couple of minutes. Once I got to work, I hit the i30's forums, hoping to get a better idea on what was happening. Anyway, John, it appears a safety recall was issued by Hyundai a few years ago to fix this issue. As I bought the i30 used a few years ago, I was unaware of this safety recall and or if my vehicle has had the sensor replaced. Given it is now 2019, would Hyundai still replace this faulty sensor on my 2010 i30 if it has never been done before by the previous owners? Okay, so I just checked this. There was a product safety recall issued on 37,334 Hyundai i30s on sale new from 18 December 2010 to 29 March 2012. That recall went live on the 8th of March in 2016, so broadly three and a half years ago. Apparently the defect stems from a potential assembly defect that can crack the case holding the stability control black box, all right? Water can then get into that, and as we all know, water and computers generally don't mix. So if that happens, the ESP system has something of a heart attack and the dash lights up, exactly as Ben has observed. Hyundai will replace the ESP module for free via its dealer network, but here's the relevant kicker for today. Owners of affected vehicles will be notified by letter. And that's fine if they want to do it the old fashioned way, you know, it's fine provided the company knows that you own the car, which they do if you are the first owner. Obviously, you know, the dude who buys it new from the new car dealer. But the car maker, sadly, is not clairvoyant. If you're the second, third or whatever owner you need to make them aware that you are now the proud owner of their used car. And you can generally do that pretty easily. It's online. All you need is the VIN code to identify the vehicle and your own details to identify you. You just fill out a form, okay? It takes a couple of minutes and then if a recall is issued subsequently in the years ahead, you'll get notified and you won't be driving around therefore in a potential death trap with a ticking time bomb at the risk of sounding like some bad grab from tabloid television. So just do that. And the day after you do that, in the week ahead sometime, do this. Visit any authorized dealer with the VIN code. That's kind of important too. Just hop into the service department and explain that you have just bought this proud automobile. Ask them to check if there are any outstanding recalls or service campaigns on your quote unquote new car. Service campaigns are kind of like recalls, okay, only they cover non-safety defects. In Australia, recalls are issued only for serious safety defects. So non-safety defects are fixed under the rubric of service campaigns. Happily enough, all of this work gets done for free, and my understanding is that there is no statute of limitations on recalls, right? Ben's recall will be done free even three and a bit years down the track on a nine-year-old car or whatever. And don't feel guilty about getting the dealer to do this to you, for you, for free, because A, they're a car dealer, so who cares, and B, they send the importer a bill for doing the work, right? So recalls and service campaigns are definitely an earner for the dealer. It's just that somebody else gets the pleasure of footing the bill. 
So what are you waiting for? Do it. Do it this week if you own a used car. It's kind of important. I got this comment yesterday and I'd suggest it's perfect. Listen, fuckstick, say something stupid and I'll jump all over this comment section like a conservative on an unemployed person. Until then, I'll just continue to golf clap and nod sagely and link to the suggested reading. That is just perfect. You know, only in Australia would somebody start complimentary feedback with the words, listen, fuckstick. It's just perfect. And such a funny turn of phrase, too, when you think about it. Not used nearly enough, I'd suggest. I therefore declare Sunday the 17th of November 2019 National Fuckstick Day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bonus points for like a conservative on the unemployed. Also, a pretty good societal temperature taker there. You've got potential, Andrew. Use it. And yes... Everybody should read Wikipedia's entry on instrumental convergence because the worst case scenario for the development of proper artificial intelligence could indeed be inevitable. Sobering stuff, James Cameron might not have been far from on the money all those years ago. So thanks for the link, Andrew. <laughs> My cock and I fuck stick right back in your general direction. <laughs> Hashtag respect. I have two granddaughters who are approaching car license age and I would like to share some of your thoughts about cars and driving with them. However, many of your reports are littered with pretty bad language that I know their parents would rather they not read. As these kids are your future readers and as we old farts die off, it may be a good idea to tone it down. It's a very interesting point, you know, I hadn't really thought about ensuring an audience for me after death. Jesus. I know everyone is a frustrated executive producer, especially people with no media training or experience. Great show, but you should do this or you should avoid doing that. <laughs> It may interest you to know that YouTube provides endless analytics. They are endless, and I tend to make data-driven content decisions, believe it or not. I know, it's a character flaw. Likes to dislikes, 95% plus. Audience, 99.7% adults, 95% males. Profanity is just part of the deal. It's hardly antisocial in this context. Quite the opposite, I'd suggest. It is part of the social fabric. It's woven in. Why avoid it? You know, the way I speak in these reports is really no different than the way blokes speak on the job, in the gym or down the pub, at least in my experience. I've worked on radio and in TV where you have to fake a great high level of genteel conduct that is quite unrepresentative, in my view, of normal social interaction, which is why TV and radio are dead, because they fail to connect by virtue of them being unauthentic. And I am simply not prepared to fake it or be unauthentic here. So just suck it up or watch friggin' cat videos. I don't care. So to you, Vic, I would say those granddaughters over whom you are so demonstrably protective are welcome to watch my videos anytime anywhere. And if they help them stay safe, then great. Mission accomplished. I'd suggest they're on their best behaviour around you, mate. Not too many F-bombs, I'm sure. Only occasionally. The better to remain in the will, perhaps. Especially as you plan on dying so soon, apparently. But I guarantee they know all the expletives and all the syntactical conventions surrounding their correct conversational deployment. I guarantee they use all the words conversationally among their peers. This is just how we roll. Down under. The final point I would make to Vic around these apparently Victorian parents, right? If they are in fact the kinds of dipshit parents who object to words like, I don't know, dipshit being deployed to satirical effect, not only do they need to protect their children from the likes of me, but also from modern classic movies such as the Wolf of Wall Street, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, which used the word fuck 569 times, which is um, 3.16 FPMs, or fucks per minute, 
which is a little over once every 20 seconds on average. <laughs> yes. There's also End of Watch with Jake Gyllenhaal, 326 fucks. Pulp Fiction, another classic movie starring John Travolta and Samuel L., 265 fucks. The Departed, again starring the increasingly foul-mouthed Leonardo D., 237 fucks there. True Romance, starring Christian Slater, 234 fucks. Hot Tub Time Machine, also an interesting one. John Cusack, the 51st most fuck-dense English language film ever, 212 fucks. Bad Santa, another comedy classic, Billy Bob Thornton, yes. 173 incredible fucks. Snatch, perhaps the most awesome Guy Ritchie movie ever. The squeaky clean Brad Pitt, too. 159 fucks. Goodwill Hunting. The even squeakier and even cleaner Matt Damon. Number 126 on the most fucked film dialogue totem pole with 154 actual fucks. Special mention here, obviously, to Samuel L. Jackson for his epic contribution to all of this. Expanding the creatively nuanced use of the word motherfucker in film. He can make that word mean friggin' anything. It's incredible. Enough is enough! I have had it with these motherfucking snakes on this motherfucking plane! And so he would want to, having used motherfucker 171 times across a total of 29 movies, which is uh, 5.897 MPMs, or motherfuckers per movie, in case you are interested in the statistics. It's not funny. So, in closing, I'd suggest that attempting to protect a teenager from this tsunami of pop culture profanity is a fool's errand. You might as well try to stop the next friggin' sunrise. You're up against Samuel L. Jackson, mate, and I've seen all of his movies. They, that never ends well. The best that you can hope for here is that they develop a strong sense for socially appropriate deployment of profanity. Generally not a good idea during a job interview or the wedding vows. So I ask you, Vic, what would really be more confronting for those conservative parents? Knowing that the world's only evil automotive garden gnome <coughs> and his cock have inflicted their foul mouths, <coughs> mouth and beak, <coughs> whatever, on those innocent teenage girls, or getting a call from a social worker in a trauma centre at a major hospital at 3am. You know, it goes like this. Your daughters have been involved in a car crash. You need to come to hospital now. It's quite serious. If they're the friggin' options, mate, as a parent, I know which one I would prefer. 